Hey, um, welcome everyone to the weekly ITC lunch. We just heard a, a, an excellent talk by uh, Christoph Wimiger, uh, visiting us from uh, Amsterdam. Uh, and he will uh, speak about uh, uh, other things in a few minutes. Um, we'll start with the vet uh, centers that will tell us uh, from the CFA that will tell us about 30 years of uh, radio observations of type 1A uh, supernovae, two of them. Uh, and then uh, we hear from Roger Sammons, uh, visiting us uh, from not so far away, MIT. We don't see MIT people very often, but we're glad to see some. Uh, and he will talk about geobiology, a primer. That's a very interesting subject. We look forward to learning more about it. And then uh, Christoph will tell us uh, about what's new concerning the Fermi Galactic Center GEV excess. And what he means by new is in our understanding, not in terms of that the galactic center changing. Um, and so it would be interesting to see if it, if it says something about the dark matter, for example. Um, and finally, we'll hear from Carl Rodriguez, our own, um, who will tell us um, about relativistic free body effects in hierarchical triple systems. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so hello to everybody. If I haven't met you yet, I started my postdoc hello. in October. I'm a radio astronomer in the OIR group because those designations make a lot of sense, and OIR is traditionally supernovae. And I wanted to tell you today about a paper I just got accepted last month about 30 years of radio observations of two nearby type 1A supernovae, 1972E and 1895B, and what they can tell us about the progenitors for type 1A supernovae. So just a quick primer for those who are less familiar with them. Uh, type 1A supernovae are, of course, uh, really important in cosmological studies, but what causes the destabilization of the white dwarf is not really understood. There's uh, several progenitor models. Uh, the two main ones are a single degenerate. So this is if you have a white dwarf with a normal companion, it's slowly accreting material, and then eventually you get to the Chandrasekhar limit, and then it explodes. Or double degenerate is basically two white dwarfs that undergo some sort of merger process, and that leads to the type 1A supernova explosion. There's a lot of different flavors in the double degenerate in particular on how this can get to there. So you can have them slam together. You could have them uh, in some sort of common envelope ejection or something like that, and then they eventually merge. But so those are the two general categories. Uh, the reason this is interesting and one way that it's been proposed to get down to the bottom of what's happening in these type 1A supernovae is studying the CSM or circumstellar material, so material ejected by the system before the supernova occurred, and that could maybe hold the clue for what is going on in these supernovae. The reason radio observations are interesting, so we see this for core collapse supernovae, as the shockwave goes out, it will interact with this material in years or even decades after the supernova explosion. And that can tell you a lot of information about what caused the original supernova. Um, so basically, in the, t in the case of type 1A supernovae, we're thinking a single degenerate would have some sort of wind-type structure. So you would have more dense and then it gets less dense as you go further out. Uh, unfortunately, we've had a very nearby type 1A supernova enough that we have very good limits. So it does not seem that there's a wind-driven profile around these uh, type 1A supernovae for a single de uh, degenerate system. Uh, double degenerate, though, you can get more complex because, as I said, you could have shells uh, further out from, say, a common envelope ejection. You could also have, uh, well, that's probably a bit more seed, uh, single degenerate, but if you had, say, a nova, a recurrent nova, you could have a very clean environment further in and more shells further out. And as I said, radio waves would be a very good way after the emission is faded in optical to see if there's anything going on around these structures. There's also some interesting things, because to date, there has not been a radio detection of a type 1A supernova, but we do know they eventually turn on on radio. We know this from our own galaxy. So you have Kepler's and Tycho supernovae we think are type 1A, or we know are type 1A supernovae. There's also a G1.9 plus 0.3. This was a supernova that went off circa 1900 in our own galaxy, but it was behind dust clouds, so it was not seen in optical. And we can see these now in the radio, so we know, and uh, x-rays, so we know that these things do eventually turn on. So if you're thinking about studying these years after, you can also, if, say, if you're in a constant ISM uh, environment, so constant density, the more stuff you run into with your shockwave, the more radio emission you're going to have. You're actually better 
than looking, say, within that first year of radio to see what's going on around the supernova. And as I said, the uh, presence of shells. So with this, uh, we were thinking about uh, nearby type of supernovae that are older that we could have a good data set for to see what exactly is going on around these guys. So there are two nearby type 1a supernovae in the galaxy NGC 5253. It's a dwarf galaxy about three megaparsecs from us, so as local as you can get without being in the local group. Uh, supernova 1972e was the classic type 1a supernova. That's actually the spectra from that were what led us to figuring out what drives the uh, emission from type 1a supernovae. And um, also the last time these were observed or published had anything on them, it was 1985. So there was a bit of time. But there is archival data from this galaxy from 1981 to 2016, because people just look at nearby dwarf galaxies for various reasons. The second supernova, I wanted to go in a little, because this is pretty cool. It was uh, the same galaxy, had another second supernova, 1895b, which was discovered you know, in this building by <laughs> William Ena Fleming. And I actually found the original circular, because ADS is great, uh, which is you know, from Pickering. Mrs. Fleming found a new star. Uh, in NGC 5253, so that tells you the NGC catalog is not as new as you think it was, and things like that. And of course, if you start a postdoc here, what's the first thing you do? You write to Lindsay to ask for your plate stacks tour and to see the discovery plate for your supernova. So we went in, and I don't know if you know, uh, everybody knows this, but they wipe clean uh, the markings on the plates uh, when they digitize them. So we basically had the previous plate and the discovery plate and had to go and look and try to find our supernova and geez, like a lot of respect to those women. Everybody should go do that sometime if you think we're hot stuff. But to be nicer, they also, you know, take a picture before. So this is what where the supernova was, and that's apparently a bright new star if you're a Harvard computer woman. Anyway, so that was just kind of a cool segue that it all came together to come and give this talk here and everything like that. But so what we ended up doing was we as I said, we went into the VLA archives. And we basically imaged all the data sets that existed for the supernova. And it's a very long uh, period of time. So spoiler alert, we still have not detected radio emission from type 1a supernovae. But I'm going to build a plot here to explain what's going on. So this is years after the supernova on the x-axis. And then we have the luminosity, so adjusting for the distance here. And uh, what we can do, for example, is you can say, if we had you know, a constant density environment and we had the shock wave going out, so if we apply supernova physics, uh, these are the limits we can get down to in terms of we don't see you know, down to one atom per centimeter cubed. That's pretty consistent with uh, ISM levels, um, 10, 10 atoms per centimeter cubed, just to give you an idea. So this is clearly a bit of a clean environment, and it's over a very large bit of parameter space. Just to give you a perspective here, so usually most people so far have looked for type 1As in the first year, look, trying to get those wind-driven limits down. So that's kind of where you are going to be if you're looking in the first year in terms of a constant ISM. And then uh, this is also just for further perspective. So Kepler, Tycho supernova, these are the detected ones, G1.9 plus 0.3. This is a supernova that went off in an Andromeda galaxy, and then uh, Sumit Sarbad Hickory in Michigan he uh, basically stacked a lot of uh, VLA observations to try to get that really deep limit. Unfortunately, it's in the, near the center of Andromeda, which is very radio noisy, so he couldn't get more than a two sigma uh, limit on that. Uh, so we can definitely get down to pretty low limits there. Uh, the other thing we can consider are shells surrounding the supernova. So if we take, there's a lot of models for nova shells and then how radio emission will fade if you just had a shell with a shockwave going through it and things like that. So if we have, for example, three different shell models, we assume the shock wave is going out at a certain speed. Then we could say, so say it's a thin shell, so that would be something like a very thin planetary nebula or a thin nova shell. That's sort of the limits you can get down to. The med medium shell is if you had a lot of nova shells basically stacked together. And then thick shell is you're starting to get to very like ISME levels or something very thick. Um, and as you can see, Based off of this, over time, you can really get down to 0.01 solar masses. So you can really start constraining what sort of shells you're seeing, uh, or not seeing, rather, around these uh, type 1a supernova. This is specifically for 1972e, because 1895b, it's evolving a bit further. And a lot of these models don't yet work for once you get into these later stages after the supernova, like over a century after uh, the explosion. So sort of to wrap up here, um, you can go check out the paper and we do a very thorough analysis of the various types of type 1a progenitors that are still allowed and which ones we ruled out. But uh, basically from this method, we can rule out most recurrent novae. 
We can also mer uh, rule out white dwarf mergers where the delay is just a few hundred years. So if you had a white dwarf merger where then thousands of uh, years pass or something like that, where all the uh, CSM can basically dissipate and you just have the ISM around it, then that is um, still permitted. Uh, various shells that are ejected, um, uh, several other things like core degenerate and some more exotic uh, types of supernova uh, explosion. Scenarios that are still possible. So if you had, as I said, something there, it's like a very long time scale between the uh, white of a merger and then the CSM ejection. And there's still some SD systems. So that's like if you had, you know, uh, some Nova shell where the shell has gone out and it's been a very clean environment inside. So something where it's been like a thousand years, that's also possible. To wrap this up though, uh, so once we had these, I should note the 2016 observation we had, the maximum time on it, because we, of course we didn't choose the times, was 40 minutes. You can do about 20 minutes more to get to the confusion limit of the VLA. So we applied for more time, and we also applied for a population of decades old type 1A supernovae out to uh, about 15 to 20 uh, megaparsecs from us. And that data is now on disk. So hopefully we will see, the uh, once I get around to looking at it, uh, the first emission from a type 1A supernova at later times. So stay tuned for that. All right, thank you. Um, so I think some people have thought about this. So uh, the trick is, uh, for 1987A, for example, which is, of course, a different kind of supernova explosion, there was, during the prompt emission, like one random blob that was visible for a few days and then wasn't seen after. And some people have speculated maybe that was either a dense clump or a planet or something that got destroyed. Um, I think, so. yeah, some people have thought about it, but honestly, uh, not most people haven't really gotten into that because it's also just tougher to do those observations. It would probably be very close in when you still have a lot of bright optical light that would obscure most of the signatures for that. Uh, these are not. The ones that we've now taken uh, with the VLA are going to get down to them. Yeah, we can get down to well, the estimate I made when I wrote this proposal was 0.1 atoms per centimeter cube. So if we're not seeing any emission just from ISM surrounding these, we actually have probably a host of other questions that need answering. Yes. I think I came across those at one point, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll come find you. <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, are there any other historical supernovae uh, that have been identified as 1A? That as I said, so supernova 1885A in Andromeda is a type 1A. Um, that's basically, and these are the most local. There's a supernova 1930-something was, 37. like, 37C. None in the Milky Way. As a, there's a G1.2 plus 0.3, which we found the shell emission or the shell for, and you can calculate it went off probably circa 1900, but we didn't see it. So. Up or not in the Milky Way. Yeah, the Milky Way we have three. <laughs> that is true. Yes, but if you're trying to find the CSM, you gotta stick close. <laughs> Ah, uh, if I knew that, I would, uh, yeah, go to Vegas, I think. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> One, I guess, in the last 200 years <laughs> that we know of or that we found. Did you? What, what could you do in the Magellanic Clouds? There's like 50 supernova remnants, and people have an idea which ones might be co-galatomic by C1H. So that kind of gets into the ancient question. I don't quite know the ages for those off the top of my head because, of course, this is still, we were assuming mainly the free expansion phase. And then, of course, you have the set off Taylor phase kicks in. As I said, for 1895B, you're probably starting to get that. So these models would have to be adjusted for that sort of thing. <laughs>
Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I guarantee it's going to be very different to previous talk. So, <clears throat> in the field of geobiology, we're studying the role of biology in the geologic, environmental, and, and issues of climate change throughout Earth's history. Uh, because we're, we know that since life began, it's continually shaped and reshaped uh, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, and even the solid Earth. So the topic of geobiology is focused on the concept of life as a geological agent over the roughly last three and a half billion years. Of course, the term geobiology was, uh, I guess, reworked by NASA in the invention of the subject of astrobiology, uh, which just extends these ideas out uh, beyond the Earth system. But for the sake of this talk, we'll just focus on the geo because that's what's tangible to us. That's what, where we have data. That's the things that we can study. <clears throat> so one of the key issues about learning about life's uh, uh, reorganization of our planet is that for most of the planet's life, uh, uh, life was entirely microbial. Fossils are extremely rare. Most or many, many fossils, uh, at least the ones older than two and a half billion, are extremely uh, controversial. Uh, lots of, I think, false reports uh, of biolog supposed biological objects that really don't stand up to scrutiny. So uh, <clears throat> one of the things that, that we find useful is being able to study microbes through their uh, the, the chemical processes that they operate. Rather than look for fossils, uh, you can look for other ways in which these microbes will have changed the Earth system. And of course, uh, the most profound of all is the way that microbial uh, photosynthesis has reshaped our atmosphere, and particularly in respect to the rise of oxygen. And for many years, people have studied this through the rock record. Uh, uh, an example of a rock, a very big rock, uh, exemplifying atmospheric oxygenation is the deposition of banded iron formations like this one here from the uh, Hammersley Ranges in Western Australia. The, uh, the rocks are roughly two and a half billion years old. Uh, it's a massive deposit of iron oxide. It's a chemical sediment that was deposited at the, at the bottom of a deep ocean. You get some idea of scale. This is a ginormous truck uh, that carries, carries iron ore out of these mines. They're now operated uh, remotely because it's safe, or, or either remotely or by women because they are safer drivers than men. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> I digress. <coughs> so this is the crudest expression of what people think about or over after many years of research into Earth's uh, 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 oxygenation. Uh, this one from 2008 and the red line is the tracing the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere on a log scale uh, from <coughs> values probably below 10 to the minus 5 of the present atmospheric concentration through geological time from say 4 billion through to the present and there's this massive leap in atmospheric oxygen at roughly two and a half 2.3 billion years, there's a period of stasis through what we call the Proterozoic and then another rise uh, that coincides with the advent of uh, complex life, that is animal life on the Earth. And uh, the, uh, the big advance in biology, as I'm sure you're aware, is the advent of the genomic era and the ability to query the genomes of contemporary organisms which hold a record of uh, Earth's life and compare those with data that we get from geochemistry, that is data coming from the rock record, allows us to independently test uh, different biogeochemical hypotheses. <clears throat> so I'll just talk about one uh, very briefly, and that is uh, concerning the ability of organisms to make sterol. Uh, we wouldn't be here without the cholesterol uh, that uh, makes our membranes uh, function in the way they do. And uh, the ability to make sterol is, it has, uh, is 
I guess, the foundation of complex life. And uh, this is a diagram. The detail does not matter. But <laughs> what it's showing you is a biochemical pathway from a precursor molecule called squalene uh, down to uh, sterols at the bottom. And the key issue about this is that there are three, uh, three particular variations of the pathway. Most important aspect being that they're all oxygen intensive. So uh, we need 11 moles of oxygen to weight to make one mole uh, of cholesterol. So the idea is that this could not have come about until uh, uh, atmosphere, uh, oxygen was uh, freely available in the environment to uh, participate in the biochemical pathway leading to sterile. And uh, I guess one other point is that those we have independent evidence that, that, that those sterile pathways, the, what, the one that we have uh, and the one we operate is inherited from uh, our uh, earliest animal ancestors. So the first steps in sterile uh, biosynthesis are uh, the epoxidation of this molecule squalene to form squalene epoxide and the, and the enzyme is S, called SQMO. And the second one is the cyclization of this molecule into a, a sterile precursor called lanosterol. So uh, students and a postdoc in our, in our lab wrote scripts to vet all these particular proteins from the NCBI database. Whoops, what's going on? <coughs> uh, Map their distributions across taxa. Uh, made trees of the genes from the different uh, clades that make sterile. <clears throat> and uh, rooted trees using different combinations of these genes and genes for other processes that we think are important in uh, oxygen metabolism or oxygen protection. And then uh, vetted the database and uh, come up with trees. So here are two trees, tree for the uh, SQMO gene and tree for the uh, OSC gene. These are the different... Uh, taxa of life that have sterile biosynthesis. So this is the animals, the fungi, there's a group of bacteria in here, and there's uh, some algae here, and there's another bacterial group. And the key thing that you learn from doing this uh, activity is that these genes virtually that, that, uh, track each other. That means that the genes have been in uh, our ancestors ever since the genes apparently were invented and they've traveled together so, uh, to me, that, that's a, a pretty profound observation. The second observation is that there are some bacteria that make sterile. They don't have complete sterile pathway. But what people have been interested in for a long time is whether sterile biosynthesis actually arose in the bacteria or arose in eukaryotes, that is, uh, organisms with, uh, with uh, nuclei. And so here's one group of bacteria uh, the, the origin of, the, uh, of these genes back here sometime back in geological time, but there's been a horizontal gene transfer between the bacteria and the eukaryotes. There's been a second transfer subsequently in, in the history of life. But the question is not answered. The, the question that we cannot answer from this information is whether the pathway actually arose in bacteria or it arose in more complex organisms. But... Uh, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time because there's a lot of information. It's just showing the arrangement of genes on a, on a, on a cassette in organisms, showing that uh, wherever they occur, the green one and the orange one are always occurring together. Many, many interesting issues that, that uh, you can uh, uh, derive from this particular picture. But the point I'm trying to make is that once you have trees like this, then you can um, operate molecular clocks and you can get some idea of the timescales under which these particular processes happen. And because animals all have the uh, ability to make sterile, and because we have fossils of animals that, that reasonably constrain the origins of those uh, organisms, then we can use the timescale that you get from the fossil record to calibrate your molecular clock to look at sterile biosynthesis. And uh, when you do that, so here are uh, 
the animal fossils. There are, there are a couple of other uh, fossils from algae used to calibrate uh, a time scale, put a time scale on this particular tree for uh, sterile biosynthesis genes. And the grey lines here uh, show error bars, but we can see that the uh, uh, origin of sterile biosynthesis occurs sometime between two uh, and two and a half billion years ago. Uh, you can, you can uh, propagate the errors in these molecular clocks and you can come up with this picture showing various uh, combinations of uh, trees made from the two genes together, trees made from the genes separately, and uh, these are the, this is the distribution of the errors for the molecular clock. And you can see they're all coinciding with roughly uh, 2.3 billion years, which is the time that, that we think uh, it's, it's, it, it's the best timing that we currently have for the advent of the, or the great oxygenation event, uh, the advent of uh, the rise of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. So I'll just leave you with this picture which is Earth's uh, biogeologic clock showing uh, different events in Earth history. Clearly photosynthesis arose well before the advent of oxygenic photosynthesis, but we have uh, cyanobacteria producing oxygen roughly uh, two, two, two and a, probably 2, 2.7, 2.8 billion years ago. But the Earth system acted as a buffer uh, and prevented the, the free rise of oxygen until much later. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Exactly. Then. <laughs> well, you've got to start at some point, and I think that's the, the most obvious point is that Earth's atmosphere is um, uh, composed of gases that are at, at, uh, not at chemical equilibrium. So I think that's the reason that, that oxygen, oxygen and nitrogen, for example, that at oxygen and methane are uh, chemically incompatible, you would expect unless oxygen was continually being produced by a biological process that, that it would disappear from the atmosphere. So the, the reasoning is that in order to maintain an atmosphere uh, with oxygen, in, you have to keep producing oxygen biologically or some other kind of gas like, like methane. That's right, because you know, light, the Earth didn't have uh, oxygen in, in its atmosphere so it, what, half of its uh, existence. So you ha also have to catch the planet at the right point in which uh, some particular process has given rise to some detectable gas. I was wondering in your study if you had anything to say about the, the historical relation between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Uh, <clears throat> well, this comes into it because um, oxygenic photosynthesis arose in prokaryotes, it arose in cyanobacteria, but then the genes were subsequently transferred through uh, horizontal gene transfers or, the, or, or, or originally from the incorporation of a prokaryote into some kind of uh, eukaryote ancestor. So we're mapping the pres the, the the tracking of these particular processes from a bacterial, potentially bacterial precursor into more complex life subsequently. Yeah, so just following up on what Avi was asking, so in this pre-oxygenated period, uh, are there other gases that uh, were seen as repair of the kind of bacterial life that was going on in the ocean then? Uh, Potentially, because um, uh, physics tells us with the faint young sun that the atmosphere must have had a significant amount of CO2 or methane or combination of both uh, 
in order to maintain uh, aqu uh, uh, water oceans, because without the water oceans and a faint young, young sun, you would have uh, a, an ice-bound planet that potentially couldn't escape. So I don't know if does that answer your question? So, so is this finding the, so you take it from asking for if you want to look for bias in your church, free oxygen, uh, is there something based on how the bacteria operate that they give to the person the atmosphere specifically? Well, people think about methane, but methane can be made without biology. You just need uh, highly reduced rocks reacting with water, produce hydrogen, and, and potentially that you, you can make it. Hydrogen and, and uh, CO2 at high temperature will generate methane. So it's not like a slam dunk can biomarker, but there are people that working on the Mars Science Laboratory mission that think methane that they've detected in Martian atmosphere is a biosignature. That's a very interesting uh, debate going on at the moment. Yeah, and of course, the, you know, on the icy worlds of the of the outer planets, the, the Titan has an atmosphere of, of hydrocarbons, and I don't think anybody's thinking that those particular hydrocarbons were made by biology. Well, let's hope not. Huh? <laughs> Okay, um, I'm, I'm Christoph Weniger um, for, from, from Amsterdam. So I will talk about what's new about the Fermi GV access. And um, I'm not, I, I should did, yeah, put the disclaimer first that I'm not working on this myself. The last paper that we wrote about this is probably 2018, but I anyway, I will have like opinions, <laughs> so, <laughs> which, I can, which I can share. So uh, the, the Fermi GV access, I, I, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about it. It's quite popular or quite well known as a dark matter candidate. So basically the idea is we have here the gamma ray sky map as measured by Fermi. And if, if <coughs> one, and you don't see here really the galactic center shining up as a bright spot, but if one does a careful analysis, it became clear over the years, starting like in 2009 with the first papers by actually particle physicists, good enough in Hooper. Uh, and also Fermi collaboration, some people, Vital and Morselli, that there seems to be an excess of, of gamma rays at around the GeV. And initially, this was just like showing up at the galactic center because this is where people looked. But it became increasingly clear that it's actually quite extended, it's kind of spherically symmetric, and kind of looks pretty much like what you would expect from a signal from the annihilation, self-annihilation of dark matter particles into bottom quarks or something like this, with typical annihilation rates that you would expect theoretically and also masses that are just about right. So that got people super excited. Um, and the question was, and, and still is, uh, is it a dark matter signal really, a signal from dark matter annihilation? And yeah, so <laughs> um, as I said, no, nobody, uh, I'm not working on this right now, but the people that I talked to like during the last two days when I was at NYU and also Princeton, who are still working on it, they, they feel quite a bit like this. So everybody seems to be a bit tired, but still it's, it's something that it's, 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 it's just a very complicated analysis. And so things depend, results, as I will show, depend on analysis choices. And so still there's no really agreement uh, apparently achieved. So but yeah, maybe anyway get involved at some point again. So 
what, what's the GV axis? Well, I, I think the nicest way actually to look at the GV axis is, uh, was used in a paper which is basically unknown by Huang uh, and collaborators using something called information field theory. So this is stuff developed by Thorsten Enslin uh, in, in Munich and applied to a wide range of, of astronomical observations here. Basically, the idea is you, you take the entire sky and decompose it spectrally in inverse Compton component and in a, a hadronic component, pi zero, and then also look for a bump at GeV energies. And if, if one does this and also accounts for point sources and whatnot, it's kind of, it's, it's very clear that there is something special going on in the inner galaxy and uh, that there's bright excess there. If you change the color scale, this is also what they show in the paper, you see similar excesses also at the lower rate along the galactic disk, Cygnus X and stuff shows up. But in the galactic center, is clearly brightest. And this kind of underlines this kind of very nice result that spectral information is quite important if you want to get out the GEV access from these kind of data sets. At the same time, there was also a paper by the Fermi collaboration. So this was 2015. It took like six years uh, before, before this kind of was resolved and accepted as an actual access. Um, so that's a paper by the Fermi collaboration from around the same time where you same, see kind of the excess emission here. Um, but it's based not on directly the spectral decomposition, but on template analysis. So the, the idea is here to you use cosmic ray propagation models that tell you how electrons or protons are distributed in the galaxy, how they interact with interstellar radiation field, with gas in the galaxy, and then you can make predictions for what emission you would see from or gamma ray emission you see from these different components. You can subtract it from the data and then also add a dark matter component. This is much more complicated in the sense that you actually have a very low dimensional model. So you assume your templates that you generate from these models are kind of perfect, fit this to the data. And what happens is you see residues everywhere and a particularly strong one in the galactic center. And this is one of the pictures of it. So there's spectral analysis, Template analysis, best thing is to do kind of both. So good. there was lots of discussions about what this is, and already 2010 it was proposed millisecond pulsars could do the job. Um, and that, that's indeed true. So if you look at the stuck spectrum of millisecond pulsars as observed in gamma rays, it just has a spectrum that is shockingly similar to a dark matter annihilation spectrum. Uh, so you have this characteristic bump here at a couple of GeV, which you also would get from dark matter annihilation if dark matter masses are 50 GeV or something like that. And so if there would be a hundred, no, few thousand, tens, 20,000 millisecond pulsars in the galactic bulge happen to be distributed like a dark matter profile squared, this could do the job. And at the same time, when there was a paper by Brandt and Cox, and there, there are now more, uh, more studies on this, that uh, discussed that if you just look at the remnants of disrupted globular clusters, which of course have lots of millisecond pulsars in them, then these remnants and simulations also get distributed in a a radial profile that looks pretty much like the GEV axis. So this fitted very well together. So millisecond pulsars in the bulge could do the job. There are lots of questions associated to, okay, are the aging effects with the millisecond pulsars in the bulge have the same like luminosity function and properties than the ones that we observe locally and so on. Um, but it seemed, um, seemed uh, like a compelling story. Now, the big question was at this time, is, so if it's millisecond pulsars, if the emission comes from millisecond pulsars, it should be speckled. So it should be just like the overall emission from a reasonably large population and there should be substructure in the emission. If it's a dark matter signal, it should, should be smooth because it would be basically coming from the relatively small dark, smooth dark matter halo that, that increases towards the center. And you, dark matter has substructure, but it shouldn't affect, it shouldn't, the substructure effect wouldn't be as strong enough to, to cause the same effect as a number of point sources. So at that time, we, we got, in, again, also involved in, in uh, looking at the data sets. And there were two papers coming out in 2016 and then uh, accepted in FISREFLET in, uh, in, in, FIS in 2016, came out the year before, uh, one by, by a group uh, led by me. So this was a PhD student of mine, Bartels and, and others. Um, so what we did was what we called a wavelet fluctuation analysis. So we looked at the gamma ray emission from the inner like 40 by 40, 20 by 20 degree. Some astronomer told me I should have called it matched filtering with the PSF, which is true. So uh, the basic trick was we were just doing a matched filtering uh, analysis of the inner galaxy, which removes all the diffuse emission and picks out the point sources. 
some of these point sources were already detected by Fermi. Most point sources were not because they are like at the three, two, one sigma level, so actually noise. And then we ran Monte Carlos uh, for a millisecond parser population. It ran Monte Carlos, or actually we just simulated like a smooth dark matter signal. Compared both and found that there's that the three and four sigma peaks and also five sigma peaks that you see in the data in this way are compatible with the millisecond parser interpretation. Um, with luminosities up to 10 to the 35 ergs per second for the, for the millisecond parsers. So th this looked like a consistent story at that point, uh, strong indications for the millisecond parser interpretation. Um, there was another group uh, here, US-based, Lee and collaborators, Tracy Slater, Mariangela uh, Lisanti, and others. Um, they uh, used what they call, call non-Poussonian template fits. That, that's a very interesting idea. So the idea is here you have several emission templates but uh, you don't assume they are smooth, but some of them can actually have a uh, stochastic substructure. And in particular, the one that they used for fitting the GEV access is non-Poissonian. So it has, it's, it's like Poissonian noise convolved with the luminosity function of the objects that you're interested in. It's a reasonably difficult analysis to do in practice. And what they also found is when they actually fitted the GEV access, assuming that it has non-Poissonian and noisy to the data, this was preferred over a dark matter signal. And we, we kind of, get, qualitatively, we got the same answers, detailed, and if you look at the details quantitatively, there are some differences. But basically, this was pointing in the right direction, or in, in, in one clear direction. What's important to point out is that is not, none, none of these analyses actually used spectral information, simply because it's a bit tricky to include spectral information in this kind of stochastic source business. Um, so they all relied, although the GV access is a bump in energy, just on one energy range. Um, so that's one part of the story. Then a couple of years later, we continued working on it, and we asked the question, okay, what's actually the shape of the emission? Is it the overall shape? If you forget about substructure, just like the overall emission, does it like correlate with the NFW profile squared, like you would expect from a dark matter annihilation signal? Or is it actually more suggesting that the emission that we see is associated with stellar mass in the galactic bulge, uh, like, for instance, tra traced by a red clump uh, giant. Um, and that's a very difficult analysis because we try to get out this, the spatial morphology of this emission uh, by subtracting all kinds of emission components along the galactic disk that are modeled <coughs> with these cosmic ray propagation codes. As I mentioned, usually you get tons of residuals if you do this because the predictions are imperfect. So what we started doing at that point was to develop a new analysis pipeline that basically allows to put uncertainties oh, on the different emission components. How many minutes do you have? This is over. Good. <laughs> uh, I, I, did, I didn't come to what's new. So <laughs> we found it looks like, uh, like the boxy bulge, basically. And there was a recent paper which reanalyzed uh, uh, infrared data to get a better bulge model based for, on, on red crumbs. And they found if they use this better bulge model, they get an even better fit to gamma ray data. What's now new is basically that uh, these all analysis, especially the point source analysis, are, are qu became questionable again. So on the non poissonian template fit side, um, it turned out that, and this is a recent paper by uh, Tracy Slater and, and uh, her students, um, what they found is if they do this non poissonian template analysis and actually inject a signal in real data and try to recover the signal, they find that even the dark matter signal would show up as point sources. And that's the subtlety that and the way this can happen is if diffuse emission is uh, mismodeled because any residuals in the diffuse emission would be absorbed in a template like a, uh, that, that allows deviations from Poisson uh, noise in this a non poissonian template fit. Um, there are several groups working on this uh, and, and showing that this, depending on what you're doing, is a problem or not. There was another paper by Elias Kolis and collaborators uh, where they redid our wavelet analysis and masked all point sources that are now detected by Fermi and uh, found that basically in that case there's no indications for point sources left in the data. Um, however, in, the, in their case, and, and they derive constraints on the luminosity function of the millisecond parsers that you would need to explain the excess, which are strongly in tension with the luminosity function locally. What would be great to see in their paper is also actually Monte Carlo analysis of what sources you would have expected to detect in the first place. 
because it's harder to expect to detect sources in the plane than away from it. Um, so that's kind of the status. The, the, the thing that is really new is that, um, yeah, seems to be a bit, again, on the table whether the point source interpretation is really preferred or whether this preference was due to systematic uh, uh, problems in previous studies. And there are a bunch of papers upcoming. Um, this are my right. So in the future, we should just look at radio data. These are our predictions. We did them 2014. Um, but still, we didn't get time on Mirkart to look for them, actually, because there is no, was no open call up to now for, for puzzle searches. And this is my, my conclusions. So sorry for running over time again. Yes, that is true. Um, however, in order to get people actually, so bef before particle physicists got excited in this excess, basically nobody was working on it. So I guess all the progress that we actually made in understanding whether this could be a dark matter signal or not is largely due to all the crazy people who jumped on it and tried to understand it. And if it turns out to be millisecond pass, that's great. Uh, but I guess it's, it's just, part of the process, so as, as a, like somebody who looks for dark matter signals in, in any astrophysical data, you have to identify the signal candidates, and then it's very, very hard work. And you don't know, I mean, you usually don't have a list of excesses for which you don't have an astrophysical explanation that you can download anywhere, so you have to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I think the most important and exciting thing was, would be really deep searches. That I mean, you have to be a bit strategic about where to look exactly in the sky, so this has to be above and below the plane and radio to look for, deeply for millisecond passes in the inner galaxy. We made predictions from Meerkat that looked pretty good, um, but to my knowledge, they still don't have an open call for actually these uh, searches. We, we need 100 hours at least to see a few of them. But this would be pretty cool, so one can really dip very deeply into the into the like population if I use just near cards and with SKA even better. So that's a perfect target for future radio searches. So sorry, can you say it again? Yes, I, I mean, if, if one believes the radio analysis, the answer would be yes. These, these estimates were done for NFW profile squared still in these days. So if you would now do an actual search, we would update where to look according to this new information. Does anyone propose these deep searches while undoubtedly? Yes, yeah. I mean, we, we uh, so we means Francesca Calora and myself, we are part of. of Trapum, so that's or tra Trapum, I think is the correct pronunciation, which is uh, the Pulsar search team on, on Meerkat. But still, it's not part of the uh, main science goals of Meerkat. So to actually do this kind of search, we have to propose it if there's an open call where one can propose these long uh, searches. And then, then I, I would do it, definitely. I mean, if you get the time, we, we can just look for them and see what comes out. If, if, you don't, if one don't, doesn't find anything, it's, again, a bit hard to interpret because you could just say, okay, the luminosity function is different from what we see in globular clusters. This is ex extrapolating globular cluster properties of millisecond pulsars. That would be very interesting to do, yeah. No matter what, the particle may end up uh, contributing to astronomy and finding new, new that Not that, no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's end the briefing. Thanks. Cool.
So I have to apologize. I originally gave a different title for this talk, a very different title for this talk. And then, unfortunately, those preliminary results that I was going to share with you all were a little more preliminary than I had originally hoped. Um, so rather than, uh, rather than expose you all to some work, some badly in progress work, I'm going to talk instead about a recent paper that I had come out um, led by Halston Lim, who's a graduate student at MIT. Um, this is the archive phone number over here. And what we're really doing in this paper is doing a very deep dive into sort of the combination of effects that you get from two separate physical systems. What happens when you consider relativistic effects on a, on a binary orbit? And what happens when you put that binary with a third companion in a hierarchical triple system? So um, I always like to tie it back to this because this is my sort of bread and butter. And I feel like I've cheated people if I don't give at least one binary black hole uh, shout out in a talk. Right now, LIGO has detected 10 binary black hole mergers, give or take. Um, and the one thing that they all have that's relatively consistent is that they are all so far consistent with having a circular orbit. We can actually measure reasonably well how circular or ellipsoidal an orbit will be when the binary black hole crosses into the LIGO-Virgo band. Um, and so far, everything we've seen, but that's only 10 of 10 objects so far, is consistent with circularity. But a lot of the predictions out there move beyond the, the sort of basic assumptions of a circular orbit. Um, in this case, I'm going to show a movie on the left where I just throw two particles at one another in a highly elliptical orbit. And it traces out the gravitational wave along the plot in the bottom. And what you can actually see is instead of that nice smooth chirp where you just have a single multimodal um, frequency increasing in amplitude and phase, you actually get these crazy modulations as the binary processes and as the binary um, essentially circularizes through this process. In practice, right at the end, these waveforms tend to look something like this, where you have your normal basic chirp um, with significant modulations on top of it. Um, if you try to fit this in the frequency domain, you don't end up with a single nice dominant frequency. You actually end up with all of that power smeared over several higher harmonics in the waveform. Um, if you listen to it, it actually sounds kind of like a lawnmower with a chirp over it. It's real weird. <laughs> And people, now people have been thinking about eccentric mergers um, for about 20 years, give or take, um, at least in the LIGO band. And I'd like to show this paper first because Lin Chin Nguyen, who was at Caltech at the time, was really, I think, the first person to actually consider using long-term three-body systems to produce highly eccentric mergers in the LIGO band. In fact, she says in this paper, like t literally 20 years before it was even relevant, that something like 30% of the systems will have eccentricities greater than 0.1 by the time they cross the LIGO band. And she points to the exact mechanism, which is something called the kozai lidov mechanism, or lidov kozai depending on how Russian versus Japanese jingoist you want to be. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is actually a different case of this. Um, what Lynch and Wynn looked at was formed triple systems inside globular clusters. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is something a little bit different, which is what happens when you have a very mass asymmetric system, in this case a supermassive black hole, about 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 solar masses, and a stellar mass binary black hole orbiting around it. Because in this regime, not only do you have the normal three-body effects, but you have very strong relativistic contributions from the, from the supermassive black hole. And so uh, the Lidov kozai effect, or kozai Lidov, um, really comes down to a, a single sort of quirk of, of hierarchical triple systems. If I imagine that I have a triple system like this, um, an inner binary here and an outer binary here, um, if they're sufficiently far separated, it's a semi-stable system. And over many, many orbital cycles, what starts to happen is that essentially you don't exchange energy between the inner and outer orbits. So the semi-major axes are fixed. But you do exchange angular momentum This is uh, in a regime we call the secular regime. In this case, that angular momentum comes from exchanging the mutual inclination between the inner and outer binaries with the eccentricity of the inner binary. Over time, that looks something like this. You cause the inclination to change. That change in orbital angular momentum along the z-axis has to go somewhere. And so it comes from the eccentricity of the inner binary. Because remember, angular momentum is proportional to 1 minus e squared. Over time, over many orbital cycles, you get what, what are called these cosi cycles. Basically, these long oscillations in eccentricity and inclination uh, between the inner and outer binaries. Um, to put up a slightly more, uh, slightly more technical diagram, this is uh, stolen from one of my papers. Um, you basically can imagine this entire system as a setup between two different uh, vector sets. You've got your angular momentum, which is what we call J1, which we'll just write dimensionlessly as root 1 minus e squared. You've got that for your inner and outer binary. 
And then you have a second vector um, that points towards the direction of periaps, in this case, E1 and E2 up there. Now, like I said, in the lowest level of the, of the COSI process that we're interested in, the total angular momentum up there, L, J1 plus J2, is conserved. And essentially, J1 and J2 will appear to process, it's a simple precession effect, around that total angular momentum over each COSI cycle. At the same time, you get these long modulations in inclination and eccentricity. Um, if I plot all three of those together, I get something that looks a little bit like this. These are the sort of phase space diagrams that we use to talk about this a lot of the time. Um, on the top, I've got cosine of inclination. On the bottom, I've got root 1 minus e squared. And along the, the x-axis, I've got the argument of periaps for the inner binary. And so uh, these binaries are processing around. Each cosine cycle, they do one full orbit. And they do one full cosine cycle in eccentricity and inclination. And so for the classical picture, you just get these nice smooth tracks that depend on your initial conditions, and that's basically it. Now the way we do this in practice, mathematically speaking, is you start off with your, your normal Hamil uh, is we basically start off with a Hamiltonian approach. You assume that you can break this down into non-interacting Hamiltonians. So you've got H1 and H2 corresponding to the inner and outer orbit. Um, and then you can write down the entire Hamiltonian of the system as basically the sum of the inner and outer orbital contributions plus some interaction term. The inner and outer orbits are really easy. It's just the old school uh, undergrad level classical mechanics Hamiltonian. The interaction term gets a little more unwieldy, but you can really write it down in a, in a at least easy to look at power series in the ratio of the semi-major axes. You have your Legendre polynomials, you have your instantaneous separations, R2 and R1, and as you expand that to higher and higher orders, you get higher contributions to the interaction terms between the inner and outer orbits. And so the basic procedure is you start off with your instantaneous Hamiltonian, you orbit average it once around the inner orbit. This is the only animation I've been able to figure out that even slightly suggests orbit averaging. I realize it's more goofy than not, but bear with me. So you average over the inner orbit, you end up with your single orbit averaged Hamiltonian. Um, in this case, because the Hamiltonian for the inner orbit is constant over the inner orbit, it averages out. You do the same thing again for the outer orbit. You end up with your doubly averaged Hamiltonian. And at this point, I have a Hamiltonian that takes out all of the short range periodic orbital oscillations that I get every orbital period. And I can just talk about the bulk COSI evolution of the system. And so if I want to know, for instance, how the red vector over here, E1, changes over many, many orbital periods, I just take out my copy of Goldstein. I look up how to get um, equations of motion out of, out of a Hamiltonian. In this case, I can write down the first derivative of the eccentricity just using a Poisson bracket, taking it with the eccentricity itself. And I can work out what are called the cosi lead off equations of motion, essentially. Now, this is great if I want to just talk about the Newtonian three-body problem. The problem comes in if I want to think about relativity, which I obviously do if I'm talking about gravitational waves. And so the way a lot of people have done this in the past is to essentially pretend that you can take your normal cosi lead off Hamiltonian and add to it at the end a 1pn relativistic Hamiltonian. This is a kind of dirtbag theorist thing to do. I say that having written multiple papers where I did precisely this. Um, but we usually got away with it by sort of saying hand wavily, oh, the time scales are different, it's all <laughs> different physics, which is like half true. Um, and in this case, you do essentially the same thing. You take your Poisson brackets of the orbit average 1pn Hamiltonian. Um, you get out the classic expression for paracenter precession. You add that to your Lydov cosi um, paracenter precession. And now I have a relativistic plus three body expression for the change in E1. There are two, however, very serious problems with this that I just kind of alluded to jokingly. The first is that both of these results come from, a, from power series expansions, which are formally in different parameters. In this case, Lydov cosi is done in the ratio of the semi-major axes. Um, the post-Newtonian expansion, however, is done in terms of v over c, uh, the velocity of your particles over c squared, over c. And so on the one hand, I'm already operating essentially in different algebraic spaces when I'm doing both of these power series expansions. The other problem is that fundamentally speaking, when I do these sort of expansions of the Hamiltonian in Newtonian gravity, um, I'm using semi-major axis and eccentricity as conserved quantities of motion. The problem is, as far as relativity is concerned, semi-major axis and eccentricity are not constants of the motion. Energy and angular momentum, as we write them down, are not conserved in the post-Newtonian problem. There are relativistic equivalents that are conserved, 
but it's not the things that we normally plug into these Hamiltonians in the first place. Oh, crap. So anyway, I'll just take an extra minute here. Um, so I am not the right person to do this sort of insanely complicated uh, power series expansion. The kind of person that is, is Halston Lim, who is a graduate student at MIT, has done a lot of work on, on uh, black hole perturbation theory and two time series expansions. And so he bas basically like, nah, I can do this better. He uh, devised this scheme where he does a two series time ser uh, expansion in A1 over A2 and V over C squared simultaneously. You do that to zeroth order, you just get Keplerian ellipses out. You do it to first order in, in semi-major axes, you recover the normal cosi leadoff oscillation. If you do it to first order in delta, you get out the normal post-Newtonian expansion. And if you do it fully, you can actually get out the, the one fully correct 1pn plus cosi expansion, including relativistic cross terms that defend, depend on different powers of delta times epsilon. And so he took this, did it to the full three-body post-Newtonian equations of motions, which, by the way, include cross terms, contributions from other particles. Combining this with the Lagrange planetary equations, Halston was able to come up with a self-consistent, to whatever order you like, description of the three-body relativistic problem. Um, this is what the output of that was. Um, I'm not going to walk us through that because the buzzer rang. Also, I'm not a sadist. Um, but this is Appendix 1 from the paper. Um, <laughs> But the nice thing about this is that when you do this, you start to get this crazy behavior where essentially the phase space is no longer the Newtonian phase space of these systems. Essentially, these relativistic corrections start to push the system around from where it would be in the Newtonian case to explore new regions of parameter space that it would never get in a fully Newtonian treatment. And for instance, if I do, this is just a, the last slide, I promise. Um, if you do this for a normal three-body system, um, in this case, blue is if I just do the normal post-Newtonian correction plus Newtonian Lyotov cosine. If I add these three-body relativistic effects to it, angular momentum itself is no longer conserved in the Newtonian sense. And so it pushes these triples into different regions of parameter space that in this case make it more likely to get a high eccentricity and merge. So I really just gave this as a, as a quick sort of preview. Uh, Halston is actually coming to the BHI on April 7th where he's going to go into a lot more details about the mathematics of this, because I feel like that's really more of a BHI than a, than a CFA talk. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, I'd recommend checking it out. There is, actually. And um, so Cliff Will actually made the same point when we shared with him a draft of the paper. And so the full 1PN expressions that Halston wrote down in this paper in that appendix actually come from going to octopole order in some of the COSI uh, terms in order to backtrack terms that are formally delta epsilon to the third. Sorry, delta to the third epsilon, which corresponds to 1PN order uh, quadruple. Um, this is also a problem, right, that just comes up in the post-Newtonian expansion in general. Um, the post-Newtonian expansion does not formally conserve energy. It is not derived from a self-consistent Hamiltonian. So frequently you have to go to second order in the energy expression in order to come up with equations of motion terms that are formally first post-Newtonian order. Um, because perturbation theory is fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you compare your this lab with arc channels that are with, directly with... numerical? Uh, we haven't yet because there aren't really any direct numerical comparisons using full relativistic, uh, the fully relativistic terms. There are a lot of AR chain integrations and things like that that take into account two-body post-Newtonian effects. However, the whole problem with the, the EIH equations that Halston ended up using, which is uh, the ones I mentioned up here, stands for einstein infeld hoffman is that in the true relativistic three-body problem, the, bind, the binding energy of nearby particles contributes to my own equation of motion. So if I have a triple system um, and I have a binary over here, there is some energy associated with the binding energy of this binary. Now that energy contributes to the mass energy of the total system. So the direction of my tertiary is actually influenced by the binding energy of the, of the binary. So it's not just that I'm doing a sum over i not equal to k. I now have to include all of the cross terms as well into the equations of motion itself. There is one paper by a master student with Simon Portuguese Wart who did look at this, but I don't think they did any integrations in this regime. Well, it sounds like younger people 
more ambitious. So <laughs> yeah, younger people are much better at math than I am, or at least this particular younger person. We got to our time limit. Let's thank you. No, those I actually had ahead of time. They weren't even that appropriate. I was just like.